Coming up, we're exploring all that Western New England has to offer, including a Connecticut museum that you have to hike to get to. But the view is worth the trip. One of the most common questions is uh, how many steps, uh, you know, how much farther is it? Because once you've reached the tower, you've still got 165 feet to go. We head to Vermont to uncover the story behind covered bridges. You can now drive through them, you can walk through them. A lot of people will petition their town to shut down the covered bridge for an afternoon so they can have a wedding in the covered bridge. And we'll visit a sanctuary of art and nature nestled in the hills of western Massachusetts. It's a magical space. No matter which corner you turn around, there's something to see that'll take your breath away. Join us for those stories and more as we explore the creativity, culture, and community that makes us Western New England. Up next on Connecting Point. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. Welcome, and thanks for joining us for Connecting Point. I'm Brian Sullivan, in for Zydalise Bauer. Each week this summer, we're exploring all that Western New England has to offer. And today, we're coming to you from Shelburne Falls, Massachusetts. This picturesque New England village, which lies just off of Route 2 in the northern corner of the state, looks like something out of a movie, which is no coincidence, as it served as the setting for more than one Hollywood production. In addition to its charming Main Street, the village is notable for its glacial potholes, as the home of one of the oldest bowling alleys in the country, and for its famous Bridge of Flowers. And while we're coming to you today from the heart of Franklin County, our first story begins in the hills of Connecticut. A visit to the Hubline Tower in Simsbury isn't easy. In fact, it may be one of the toughest museums in the state of Connecticut to get to. You have to hike a mile and a half along the top of Talcott Mountain to reach the base of the tower. After that, it's another 120 steps up to the top of the observation deck. But the reward is breathtaking, a 360 degree view of the Farmington River Valley below. Connecting Point producer Dave Fraser will tell you that the view is most definitely worth the trip, and he brings us this story. As you travel along Route 202 through the Farmington Valley in the towns of Avon and Simsbury, there is a tall stone structure visible on the top of Talcott Mountain. This structure is the Hubline Tower, and it is currently owned and maintained through a cooperative effort between the state of Connecticut and the Friends of Hubline Tower. Jay Willerup is president of the Friends of Hubline Tower. Or is it Highbline Tower? There's actually three pronunciations. Highbline is the family, Hubline is the business, and the actual correct Bavarian pronunciation is Hoibline. However you choose to say it, there is no doubt that the view from the top offers an amazing 360 degree experience. Once you get to the top, again, you, you look all the way out towards New York, uh, at Mohawk Mountain, uh, up into uh, Massachusetts, Mount Tom, down to the south towards uh, Sleeping Giant in Hamden, and you see Hartford and Springfield. Most people uh, are excited to have made it to the top. One of the most common questions is uh, how many steps, uh, you know, how much farther is it? Because once you've reached the tower, you've still got 165 feet to go. Uh, and you can do that in 120 steps up and then another uh, 120 steps to get back down. Gilbert Hubline moved to Hartford with his family in the mid-1800s. He promised his fiancée that he would build her a castle on a mountain. He was here with his fiancée, uh, Louise, and he had walked up here and uh, said, someday I'm going to build you a castle here. And he was 65 in 1914 and he started it then. The Hublines were members of Hartford's social elite. Gilbert's father began a restaurant and hotel business in 1862, and the company began manufacturing A1 steak sauce and later Smirnoff vodka. The tower was used mainly as a summer retreat from the city. It is complete with luxurious bedrooms, a kitchen, and living areas on each floor, as well as the first residential elevator in Connecticut. On the top floor was a ballroom, now known as the Observation Deck, where the Hublines hosted parties and entertained their many house guests. They would arrive in the spring and uh, bring anywhere from uh, three maids, a chauffeur and a cook, as well as themselves. And uh, this would be just be a, a, an entertainment venue and they would come up here for the weekends or a week here at a time. It represents uh, Gilbert's 
German heritage from Bavaria. If you look at a lot of the Bavarian uh, pictures of uh, back where he was from, there's actually a tower that's very similar to this. Gilbert died in 1937, and for six years the tower stood empty. It was later purchased by the Hartford Times newspaper and once again became a place for parties and social gatherings for nearly 20 years. The state of Connecticut's Department of Energy and Environmental Protection was able to purchase the tower in 1966, and along with the Friends of Hubline Tower, they are doing restoration work and continuing to educate the public on the past, present, and future of this unique structure. Uh, the Friends of Heibline Tower were formed in 1985 uh, by Pat Heibline, one of the family members. And uh, it's really to kind of help augment the state and uh, start to do some of the restoration work. And we also like to educate people on, uh, on the lifestyle that the Heiblines had here and uh, what it represents to that era. And uh, we like to have people hike up here and enjoy the views and foliage and all the other things that have going on here. We encourage people to make the hike. It's very doable. Uh, I, I usually try and make an effort to not miss it. If I'm here visiting with the public, visiting with my staff, I make a point to go up to the observation deck myself and take in the view and appreciate it uh, just as the public does so that I can you know, better understand what the public is, what the reward that they're seeing at the end of that hike. We are here today in the village of Shelburne Falls at what may be its most famous attraction, the Bridge of Flowers. This former trolley bridge boasts a vast array of beautiful flowers to delight the senses, and it's open to the public from April to October. But our next story is about a bridge of a different kind. The western branch of the Westfield River is home to the first Keystone Arch bridges built in America. These magnificent granite structures made it possible for the railroad to cross the Berkshires and open a line from Boston to Albany, New York. Today, a hiking trail makes some of these bridges accessible to the public, and producer Dave Fraser takes us there to uncover the history behind the majesty of the Keystone Arches. One thing I hear a lot when I'm leading hikes out here is just how amazed people are that this could have been done at all, that this workmanship that how could they do this out here in the middle of nowhere? Secluded stone bridges of exceptional craftsmanship. The Keystone Arch Bridges are the oldest of their kind built for railroad use in the United States. Reaching heights of 70 feet, these bridges span the west branch of the Westfield River as it serpentines its way through the towns of Middlefield, Beckett, and Chester. The arches were built around 1840 to help get the Western Railroad through the Berkshires. But what actually started the push for the Western Railroad, it was called, for Western Massachusetts, was the Erie Canal. Once that opened up, all the traffic was coming in from the west, it would go to Albany, but then float down the Hudson River to New York City, and Boston was cut out, so they had to figure out a way to get to Albany. Ten stone bridges were built. Three were lost to floods, and seven remain today, some still in use by the railroad. Major George Washington Whistler, father of the artist James McNeil Whistler, and William Gibbs McNeil were the chief engineers responsible for designing the bridges, referred to by some as American cathedrals. He was surveying on horseback. They were doing things like building towers so they could see over the trees, lighting fires at night on the next hillside so they could spot you know, where they were heading and stuff when they were surveying. It's it pretty innovative. Much about the arches is on display at the Chester Rail Museum, but for an up-close look at these mammoth granite structures, visitors can hike the Keystone Arch Bridges Trail. President of the Friends of the Keystone Arches, Dave Pierce, took me on a tour recently. The walking west along the Keystone Arch Bridges Trail, the first bridge we come to is the double arch. It's the only double span on the, in the system. This is the Bancroft Arch. This is the last one still in existence in the series. It shares that five keystone cluster with the double that we were just looking at. We're now at the 65-foot arch. This is the second highest bridge in the series that's, that still exists. Okay, we're now at what we uh, have labeled the Gator Tail Arch. That's due to the very distinctive ring stones. You can see they're all pointed like the tail of an alligator. Well, we're now at the 70-foot arch. 
In the logical progression of the trail, as you're hiking west, this is the climax. Each bridge gets a little higher, a little more spectacular. Over the years, the Keystone Arches have been written about, photographed, hiked on, and explored. Recently, both the Arches and the Chester Rail Museum, which was built in 1862, were recommended for national landmark designation. Originally, two women in uh, Middlefield got them on the historic register. And since then, uh, they've been listed in the Historic American Engineering Record at the Library of Congress. And just recently, we uh, got uh, National Historic Landmark status for two of them. So that's the highest recommendation, the highest designation that there is, that up in the same category as the White House or the Washington Monument. So. The trail not only takes visitors to the first series of stone arch railroad bridges built in America, but tracks the first wild and scenic river in Massachusetts, all within the Commonwealth's largest roadless wilderness. In the era of COVID, the trail has seen an increase in visitors, something Dave Pierce welcomes. They never fail to uh, blow me away, and they're different in every season, every lighting. And it's just, it's also wonderful to see the reaction of other people when you're bringing them down here for the first time and they go, you know, wow. <laughs> and if you enjoyed that story about bridges made of stone, we hope you'll enjoy this one about bridges made of wood. Few structures in America combine architectural ingenuity, economic necessity, and romantic idealism better than the covered bridge. Today, there are just over 100 authentic covered bridges in the state of Vermont, giving it the highest number of covered bridges per square mile in the United States. And just over the border in Bennington County, you'll find five of these quintessential New England landmarks. Producer Dave Fraser paid a visit to the Green Mountain State to find out more. I think the, the fact that they're still in use, they're not monuments, the historic covered bridges here in most cases have outlasted steel bridges. The steel bridges rust. You know, look at the bridges in the interstates that have fallen down, concrete. I don't think there's ever been an accident caused by a covered bridge failure. The purpose was to preserve the bridge surface. One of the great uh, myths is, is that they, it was to keep the snow off the bridge. It was the opposite. You had to snow the bridge in the winter so the sleds could go through. And that was a, what was called snowing the bridge. And the fact that they were built without any heavy equipment, I mean, nobody had a backhoe then. No, nobody had a, a front end loader or cranes or anything. And somehow they worked out with t teams of horses how to pull up those trusses and get them built. Uh, in Vermont, there once was over 600. We now think the number is 103 and a half. The three and a half are the ones that go across the river to New Hampshire. So that's what we only claim half of those. The original truss design in the old barns was the same thing they used to build the first covered bridges. And then they, as, as they wanted to build longer and longer covered bridges, they had to go to these different kinds of trusses. We find when people come here, they are just absolutely fascinated with the way this all came about. Our late Senator Jim Jeffords got a $10 million bill put through Congress for the preservation of covered bridges. And that's one reason why even the ones that have got damaged always get restored. They are their top priority. And I think the fact that you can now drive through them, you can walk through them, a lot of people will petition their town to shut down the covered bridge for an afternoon so they can have a wedding in the covered bridge. And I think people that are used to the modern world and don't think about what was built 150, 200 years ago, when they see what was built, how it was built, and how well it stood up, I, are fascinated by it. Every week, Connecting Point explores the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. But it doesn't stop there. You can find us online anytime for exclusive features and content. 
The historical structures in Bennington, Vermont go far beyond just covered bridges and lead back to the very foundation of our nation. On August 17, 1777, Brigadier General John Stark and his men defeated the British Army in what became known as the Battle of Bennington, a key turning point in the American Revolution. A monument was erected in 1889 to commemorate this battle, and executive producer Tony Dunn takes us there. It got started around 3 in the afternoon, August 16th. John Stark talks about it being, you know, just one cacophonous sound for the whole day, practically. And they lost about 200 men. We lost about 25, but we captured about 700. I think it was Jefferson who said the battle that was fought at Bennington was the first link in the long chain of events that would bring about the freedom of America, what we had today. You can find that digital exclusive online right now at nepm.org slash connecting point. We've been coming to you today from the village of Shelburne Falls, and our next story comes to us from just a few towns over. Richard Richardson runs an antique stove shop in Goshen, Massachusetts. Behind it, Richardson has spent the better part of his life creating a sprawling art environment he calls Three Sisters Sanctuary. It combines perennial plantings, butterfly gardens, works by local artists, and a fire-breathing dragon. Connecting Point's Dave Fraser takes us there. Sometimes in life, it's clear what your purpose is. In my particular case, destiny drove me to the land of Goshen, and my purpose in life has been to build these gardens as uh, healing gardens for the public. My name is Richard M. Richardson. I am the creator and caretaker of the Three Sister Sanctuary in Goshen, Mass. Destiny brought me to Goshen. Within 24 hours of being in Massachusetts, I drove through the town and I fell instantly in love with it. And I thought if I could live anywhere, uh, this would be it. Unfortunately for me, I lost my eldest daughter and she gave me the vision to call it the Three Sisters and to continue to build it. Nature itself has been my collaborator through the entire project. So everything that I do as an environmental artist takes so long that by the time I'm done with that one section, something is dictating what I'm supposed to be doing next. I'd like to take all the credit for it being my imagination, but I feel like I'm being channeled and it's always pretty clear to me what I'm going to be doing next. I believe that this is my purpose in life and I keep putting it out to the universe with the belief that somehow it's all going to fall into place. <laughs> Physically doing it, uh, good thing I started it when I was 44 years old. That's all I got to say, you know, because as I am getting older, I am discovering that uh, it's a little bit harder physically than it used to be. Uh, but on the other hand, I love, I love creating with nature. And I love taking these beautiful stones and standing them up. And uh, so it really inspires me to, uh, to put in whatever labor and whatever money it takes to, to make the magic happen so that the sanctuary can be a gift to the Pioneer Valley. Most people come and they are very moved by it and they feel that this is a gift that they couldn't imagine was here and that to, they've discovered it. And then some people come and they just think I'm a very eccentric man and they don't quite get what it's about and they shake their head and usually they don't spend much time here. It's kind of like going to a, a museum, you know, go to Mass Mocha. You know, either you get it or you don't get it. But the more you go, the more you get it. And that's how art is, you know, you can't, the, the first time you see it, it doesn't necessarily talk to you. But the more you get exposure to it, the more it does speak to you. In this particular case, I don't know how nature can't speak to you. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, collaboration that is happening here. I'm not done. This will probably go on for the rest of my life. This piece of property, uh, I, I hope will be a gift to the Pioneer Valley, to Western Massachusetts. I hope other people will come and enjoy it as much as I've enjoyed building it.
It's a magical space. No matter which corner you turn around, there's something to see that'll take your breath away. Beloved by hikers and those who love the outdoors, Massachusetts Mount Greylock has inspired everyone from Ralph Waldo Emerson to Herman Melville. A magical spot for many, for others, it was just another mountaintop along the Taconic Mountain Range, until a handful of folks were motivated to create the state park that we can all enjoy today. Executive producer Tony Dunn climbed the state's highest peak to uncover its history. Here at Mount Greylock, the history really runs so deep Jeremiah Wilbur arrived in 1767 uh, from a farm in Rhode Island and settling in what we call the Bellows Pipe or the Notch at the north end of what is now Mount Greylock State Reservation. And in that time it would have been more or less very wild and, and still somewhat primeval. And Jeremiah cobbled together a 1600 acre farm comprising most of the northern end uh, of the mountain range including the summit. In fact, to this day, we call one area along Notch Road, Wilbur's Clearing, 400 acres of the summit that originally had been part of Jeremiah's large farm holdings uh, were sold to a group of Northern Berkshire businessmen um, who uh, went under the name the Greylock Park Association. From those 400 acres, they essentially created infrastructure uh, that supported tourism, a viewing tower, an open metal framed tourist tower, a summit house, and a coach from North Adams, and a roadway system. And that roadway system was uh, actually a toll road, the, the final mile from below the summit to the top. And you had uh, each visitor had to pay a fee, you know, much as we, you know, continue to charge a fee in order to, you know, pay the costs. And so in that sense, Mount Greylock played a very important, a very key role um, in the development of the tourist industry um, in Berkshire County and the region, really. The three founding fathers of Mount Greylock, John Bascom being the most prominent uh, to many today because Bascom Lodge was named in his honor. And he was the very first uh, gentleman to be appointed to the Greylock Commission. And Francis Rockwell, uh, for whom Rockwell Road, the road going south from the summit to Lanesboro, was named, followed by Sperry Road, uh, named in honor of William Sperry, one of the original Greylock commissioners that operated this park that leads through our campground out to uh, a scenic overlook called Stony Ledge. Because of the unique natural setting and elevation and latitude of uh, the summit of Mount Greylock, uh, it really retains rare elements of uh, plant life, wildlife, and just a physical setting that is unlike any other um, in this part of New England. Henry David Thoreau uh, would, without a doubt, uh, is the most famous literary connection to Mount Greylock. Uh, he arrived here in July of 1844, and the transformative experience that Henry Thoreau um, had here on Mount Greylock, I believe is something that continues to inspire visitors today. James MacArthur Vance uh, is another fascinating uh, personality um, that really has left his mark in many ways all over the summit of Mount Greylock. He was involved with the construction of the War Memorial Tower in 1931, and the Memorial Committee were so impressed with his work uh, that they hired him to be the architect designing the Bascom Lodge addition when the time came to construct it. And many years prior to this, he had actually left his mark in Pittsfield as the architect of what is now the famous Colonial Theater. Mount Greylock has achieved such a high profile um, as a, a recreational destination um, and as a natural setting because of its visual beauty um, and the uh, unique ecology um, that it is generally considered among the top five tourist destinations in the Northeastern United States. And in fact, William Brewster, who was a noted ornithologist in the 19th century, described Greylock as a Canadian island floating uh, above an Allegheny Sea.
And that does it for this edition of Connecting Point. Remember, you can always find all of the stories that you saw in this episode, as well as exclusive features, digital only content, and so much more online anytime at nepm.org slash connecting point. Our thanks to the village of Shelburne Falls for hosting us today. And please be sure to join us again every week right here for more stories of the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. I'm Brian Sullivan, in for Zydalis Bauer. Thanks for watching and be well. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers.